My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Floods of questions fill my mind. There are answers I seem to find alone the lord knew me before my time began so i'm trusting him to be my friend the one who holds tomorrow holds my hand my hope is in trust that he knows best my hope is in him men through history have found god is faithful and his word is sound every promise in his book is true he'll never that he knows best my hope is in him i will praise him through my darkest days for i know that through his perfect ways he is strengthening my faith, my faith. My the book of Proverbs chapter number 18, Proverbs chapter number 18, and if you can also find your place in James, the book of James, James right after the book of Hebrew, uh, we will be predominantly most of the time in the book of James chapter 3, but we are going to use the entire book of James, but we're going to start and probably keep our way in Proverbs chapter number 18, so just for the sake of time, you'll know where we are, Proverbs 18, chapter 18, verse number 21. The Bible says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If you have your Bible open, I want you to follow along with me. Notice what it says again, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Let's say it together. Starting in verse number 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. I don't know if you understand the magnitude of those words. 
I, I don't know if you can comprehend exactly what God is saying. But I will say this, that just as I spoke of that one child, every person that you cross paths with, the people that you live with, the family that you wake up beside, you have an ability to be able to either speak death or life into them. Two extremes. I don't know if you've ever done a study on the tongue, but they say that the tongue is about four inches long and about two ounces in weight. It's amazing that when you think about that and you hear this verse and you read the verse, that God is taking such a deep truth and helping you understand Open up our eyes and make us realize just how deadly, just how detrimental, just how serious the tongue really is. It's so small, but yet it can cause the greatest problems in our life, in our marriage, in our home, in our ministry, in our country, in our city. Yes, there's physical problems. But let's be honest, there's a lot of times that we are extinguishing things that have been said, rumors, gossips, naysayers. I mean, there's so many different things that we waste our energy on these things. And the reason is is because we don't realize that sometimes it's what we say does greater harm than what we do. You say, I don't believe that. Then you don't believe the Bible. Right now, I want you to think back this week. Every word that you spoke to your family... Your husband, your wife, your child, your mom, your dad, your boss, your co-worker. Somebody that you cross paths with. And let me just ask you this. For one time, can you think of one extreme or the other? Maybe there's something very easily right now that's already in your mind. And you're saying this, I wish I could take that back. But let me challenge you deeper. If you have the ability to be able to bring death because of your tongue... I wonder if anybody right now could think of a moment specifically, intentionally, that you did speak life into somebody. What was it? There's no question when you think about the inner man, the inner man, the greatest member of the inner man is the heart. The Bible says that out of the heart are all the issues of life. Everything that we need, everything that that happens, it's in our heart. We keep our heart right. Keep our heart with all diligence. We understand this. This is what the Scripture tells us. Thy word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The greatest member of the inner man is the heart. But I would say the greatest member of the outward man is the tongue. So as much as a heart that is not right can decay, the inner man is just as, just as parallel, as equal to a man that cannot control his tongue, to his outward man. Think of how many people that you heard them speak and you lost trust for them. You heard not just what they said, but you also heard how they said it. Sometimes, you may be better than me, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And because of the tone that you use it in, you might say the right thing, and it might be at the right time, but it's not with the right spirit. You say, well, that's what the Lord said in the Bible. Yeah, but he didn't tell you to be able to act that way when you said it. Somebody say amen. And we justify ourselves because we don't understand that in every, every, every word that comes out of our mouth, that we must be led by the Holy Spirit. Everything. Everything. So much that it's not ironic to me. I believe that it's obviously led by the Holy Spirit. That what does the Bible say? Out of the heart, what? what out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaketh. That, that means that in other words, that if your speaking is not what it should be, if your words are not what it needs to be, then according to the Scripture, your heart's not right. So I would say to you, challenge yourself. Challenge yourself. Ask yourself, was my motive, was my goal to breathe life into that person? Was it to bring life into that that married couple? Was it to help, watch this now, that young Christian? Well, I was just telling them they need to be careful about the way they carry themselves. No, what you was trying to do is, remember what I said the other day? You was trying to be concerned, but you was really being critical. And see, you and the Holy Ghost knows it. 
But every mom, every dad, every husband, every wife, every child, every co-worker, every leader, every pastor, every church member, every brother and sister in Christ, we all, do you understand this? Every word, every word has the power of death and life. And sometimes people say, well, I'm not a preacher. I don't have to worry about what I say. I'm not a CEO. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not the boss. I'm not the manager. I'm not. No, 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 no. But every word that you say still carries the power of death and life. I want you to turn back, if you will, to chapter number 17. All throughout the scripture, you're going to notice that this is something that's a common thing. Matter of fact, when you speak, it's either going to be death or it's going to be life. There is no in-between. Watch me now. It's just like heaven or hell. You're either saved or you're lost. Your words are even given life or it is giving death. There, there is no such thing as a gray area. The Bible says in chapter number 17, follow along with me. We're going to identify what these verses speak. Verse number 4, we'll pick up. The Bible says this, a wicked doer, watch this now, giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. What do you get there? You get the power of death. Go down, if you will, to verse uh, number 7. The Bible says this, Excellent speech becometh not a fool. Well, that's life. But notice in the same verse right after that, Much less do lying lips a prince. That's death. Down to verse number 20. The Bible says this, He that have a froward heart findeth no good, and he that have a perverse tongue falleth into mis mischief. Now you see the power of death. Go down to verse number 27. The Bible says this, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Now we see the power of life. Verse number 28, the Bible says this, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Now we see the power of life. Chapter number 18, verse number 4, the Bible says this, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and a wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. We see starting off in chapter 18, you see the power of life. But in verse number 6, as soon as you get life, the Bible says this, A fool's lip enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of a soul. So now we quickly went from the power of life to now the power of death. Verse number 13, the Bible says this, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly. It's folly and shame unto him. Now we see the power of death. Verse number 23, the Bible says this. The Bible says, The poor useth entreaties, but the rich answereth roughly. Notice, if you will, now again we see the power of death. Chapter number 19, verse number 1. Better is the poor that walketh in his, in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Now we see the power of death. Verse number 5, the Bible says this. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. We see the power of death. If that's not enough, we see it again. Notice in verse number 9, the Bible says this, A false witness shall not be un unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. The power of death. Verse number 11, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. You see the power of life. We could go on and on throughout the Bible, but I want you to see how quickly it goes from one extreme to the other. How you choose and understand the word that I say there is very clear, choose. There is no such thing as the devil made me say it. Matter of fact, I heard it from somebody else. We say that our kids a lot. Son, who did you hear that from? Daughter, who did you hear that from? Yeah, they should not have ever heard it from that person, but they still chose to speak that way. When you and I stand before God, we can't say, well, my favorite preacher used to talk like that, or my spiritual hero used to talk like that. Watch me now. My mom and daddy talked like that, so when I was being raised, I thought that's the way you spoke to people. So when I got older, it's just who I am. No, God didn't save you for you to stay who you were. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Life or death. And I wonder right now, as you think about it, What's coming out of your mouth? Oh, it's Sunday morning, I understand. 
I, I'll be honest with you, and I'll be very transparent. This is not one of those things that I look at people and I think about people. I'm going to be honest. I've been convicted in this. There's some things in my Christian life, if I can be very honest and, 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 and just transparent for a moment, I, I have my strengths and I have my weaknesses, Brother Danny. And, and one of my things, I try to be very careful with my words. I do. I try to be very careful with my words. But as careful as I am, I've been convicted. Not just by what I say to my family or the way that I speak to my son, but the way that I speak to uh, my friends, uh, the way that I speak to this church. I have multiple people in this church, and you know who you are. That If I ever preach something, I usually go to them. Was my, uh, was my spirit right? Why? Because I think everybody needs accountability. It's the way we say things. We, we need to know that. But as I studied this, and I realized, Brother Travis, how he says one extreme or the other, either death or life, I'm convicted. And I think to myself, how many people are living because of something I said. Or how many people are dying? Or maybe I can say it this way. How many people are stumbling along the journey because of maybe something that I said? I should have said something different. I, I should have encouraged them. I, I should have maybe prayed for them or spoke a word and encouragement to them. Told them it's going to be all right. God's going to take care of them. Or maybe just give them a good word. I don't know what it is. But how many opportunities have I missed? It's amazing that the same lips, the same tongue that brings praise, the same tongue that brings prayer today, today, and y'all don't be quiet on me now, the same lips that brings worship in here, the same lips that bring, hey, brother, good to see you, doing all right, I love you. I wonder what that same tongue said this week in the four walls of your home. What about your job? What about your school? Oh, I understand. I don't speak much. No, but I know how to text. Can I tell you something? Every word you'll give an account for. You could text it. You could post it. You could tweet it. You can Instagram it. You can do whatever you want to, or you could audibly speak it. But every word that you say has the power of death and life. I wonder how many people today are still wounded because you spoke a truth that you should have never spoke of. I wonder how many people are sitting in a deep ditch today because, yes, they messed up, just as you and I have messed up, but because you put them in their place, they can no longer rise to the occasion. Or I wonder who's in the choir today because when they thought that there was no hope, you was the one that maybe wrote them a card or maybe sent them a text or gave them a phone call. And because of what you said, they understood that God does forgive. And just like they just sung in the song that nothing is greater than the grace of Jesus. And if it was not for you, they were holding on the best they can going under. But because you spoke words of life, they're serving the Lord again. You don't have to agree with me. And you don't have to agree with the Bible. But the reason why we like to be able to speak things and for people to be able to know is because of pride. Pride is destroying churches. Pride is destroying homes. Pride is destroying marriages. And pride ain't just, I want everybody to be able to know who's right and wrong. Pride is also wanting people to know that you know things that other people don't know. Amen. I'm preaching this straight, friend. When the truth be told, if the Holy Ghost was to stand here and all of me speak, every one of us would not only crawl under the pew, but most likely we'd walk out the house of God because we would be ashamed. Ashamed of everything. Why? Because we're so quick to speak words of death. One man by the name of A.B. Simpson. It's a little deep, but I want you to listen to this, and I quote, he says, I would rather play with lightning or taking my hand, living wires, than to speak a reckless word against a servant of Christ, or idly repeat the slanderous darts which thousands of Christians are hurling on others to the simple hurt of themselves and their own souls and their own bodies. He said, I'd rather be struck by lightning. I'd rather 
rather be shocked by electricity. I'd rather, I'd rather feel it through my body than I would to be able to bring such hurt and pain on somebody. And see, the problem is when pride settles in, then that tongue gets loose. When people throw mud, everybody gets dirty. Everybody. It was a couple weeks ago. It was a Sunday evening. Sometimes I get a card in the mail, just like many of you, or maybe a phone call, a text message. When I begin to study and ponder and think on these, ver- these words and these verses, in the midst of that, I was met at the door. A person of our church comes to me, not a preacher, not a deacon, not anybody of position, and says, hey, I just I want to reiterate something to you. That I don't, I don't just love what's going on, and I don't just love the church, and I don't just love your family. Look me in the eye and says, I want you to know that I love you. And that person has no idea how much those words that bring power of life, how deep they were. You never know when somebody is at wit's end. You never know when your children have that day at school and they don't want nobody to know. You never know when they're struggling to be able to meet the standard. And yes, watch me, they need to hear the words, I love you. You never know when your church family needs to hear that somebody cares that you still matter to me. You never know when the husband has been struggling. He don't say anything, but he gets up early and he goes to bed late and he's tired, he's exhausted, and he carries himself with such integrity and, and going on, but he just needs to hear the words, I love you. You never know when she has issues and she's self-conscious. And her value is beginning to dwindle because she's looking at other people, maybe comparing herself to other women. She needs to hear you say to her, I love you. I appreciate you. If you don't do it, there's a world out here that will. That's how good kids get swayed away. You remember Proverbs chapter number 2? Watch for this strange woman. Watch for the evil man. Why? Because they come in, you don't really know it, but they begin to turn your heart. And before you know it, you end up way out there. All because it starts with just listening to what they say. And after he said that, you know, it's been on my heart. I wonder how many people could say that about me this morning. And listen, I'm very blessed, just as I hope many of you are. There's many people that encourage me, and I hope that people encourage you, family and friends and and staff. And I'm so thankful for that. Thank God that we have these people that love us and pour into us. But it's not about the people that pour into us. My question to you right now is, who today feels that way because of you? Who feels appreciated? Who's at church today? Who's watching live stream? Who is believing again? Who's still married? Who's still preaching? Who's still pressing on today? Because you spoke life into them. And I wonder, God, is that me? When I preach, when I teach, am I yielded to the Holy Spirit so much that people walk out of here and and just forgive me for saying this way, that they literally feel like they can fight hell with a water pistol? They feel like there's no situation that's too grim or a situation that's too dim that they cannot overcome because with God we know that all things are possible. When I speak, do I speak in such a way that, yes, it's truth, but it's truth in love, knowing that there is a balance, that people know that God is able, God is able. Even though I fail and mess up, there's a God that's still able. And I just want to tell you today that God uses tongues. Matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of uh, Acts, when he comes to the place of Pentecost, that literally cloven tongues were like as a fire. In other words, God used those tongues. And I want to tell you right now, God can use your tongue, but he ain't going to use it unless you yield and submit yourself to him. Somebody say amen. He can do it, but you're going to yield. So what's the ability of the tongue? Number one, you write it down. There's power, the power of death. That's the ability of tongue, the power of death. The power of death. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, that the power of death and life, but the power of death is in the tongue. The tragedy is this, is the more that we speak, sometimes we speak more death, watch me now, 
maybe you ain't putting somebody down, but negativity. Always complaining. Always upset about something, somebody. You don't realize you're putting weight, you're putting weight, you're putting weight, you're putting weight, you're putting weight. You're putting weight. We can't have this, we don't have this. Your words echo in their mind. Husbands work themselves to death because of wives that cannot be content. Wives find themselves looking for attention because a man is so preoccupied by a job that he don't slow down enough to be able to say that I love you. I mean, I'm telling you these words, they go more than just what you say directly. It's how you say it, when you say it. The power of death. Turn with me, if you will, to James chapter number 1. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter number 1, notice if you will, he speaks very clearly. We'll start coming in verse number 26. He says, if any man, notice this, if any among you seem to be religious. How many of you know there's a lot of us that seem to be religious? Somebody say amen. Y'all with me? There's a lot that seem to be religious. They look good. They go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, carry the Bible. They know more than somebody else. They can probably quote verses. They seem to be religious. But the Bible says this, and bridleth not his tongue. Mmm. Bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. In other words, you can act all you want to act, but friend, if you don't talk the way you're supposed to talk, if words of life is not flowing through you out of your heart, listen, your religion might not be as much as what you think it is. It may just be that. It's a religion and not a relationship. Jesus Christ lives inside of you. You want to love people. You want to help people. You want to pick them up when they're down. You you want to be used to be a bridge so they can get from point A to point B. When you love Jesus and you say, when you love Jesus, you don't want people to hate others. No matter how much they hated you or how much they hurt you. Did you hear what I said? You want to know why? Because when you've been saved, you know that Jesus was treated the same way. But we get to be full of pride so much that it's almost like we get to this, sta this standard and we think, oh, well, I've got the right to say, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. We try to act like God. We try to act like God and people are falling victim. Families are falling victim. Kids are falling victim. Grandkids are falling victim. Churches are falling victim. And when the church goes, the community goes. And we say we want to make a difference, but you don't realize the only difference we're making is not the power of life, it's the power of death. Turn over, if you will, to James chapter number 3. The Bible says in verse number 1, my brethren, that means he's not talking to lost people, he's talking to saved people. Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You're going to give an account for every word. For in many things we offend all. Did you notice that? Many things we offend all. You know what that means? Every single one of us, the most faithful Christians that we know, and some of the most best Christians that we know, even they offend people. Everybody look up here. Even you. Even me. You study your Bible. The Bible says Simon Peter, what did he do? He calls an offense with the way that he spoke. You study out the book of Psalms and you read about Moses' life. The Bible says that when Moses came, it was literally Psalms chapter number 106, that he also offended people. Matter of fact, Paul, the great Christian, the Bible says that when you get to Acts chapter number 23, that he stands before the high priest and he looks at him and he says, you whited wall. And listen, when you understand what he was saying, in your mind, in your mind, you listen to me, this is what you think. He deserved to be called that. Paul should have called him out. Then you tell me why two verses later Paul apologized. You want to know why? Because a God-fearing spiritual man, woman, knows that you don't have the right to speak what you know and expose what you know and say what's on your mind. You are to be yielded to the Spirit because the cause of Christ in your marriage, in your children, in your church is the greatest thing that matters. So Paul says, I'm sorry. Matter of fact, he was apologizing 
to a politician. That's what he was doing. He said, I should have never said that. He's apologizing to somebody of authority over him. We sit back and let friend, just like the preacher, we slaughter people all the time. Sit around when nobody's talking, nobody's listening, nobody's around. But God hears every single word. But yet we're Christians. Religious. Notice, if you will, quickly in chapter number 3, he breaks it down. What does he say? The direction. It could be deathly because he says there in verse number 3 and 4, he says, Behold, he said, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. We turn about their whole body. And also the ships, which they are be so great, are driven with fierce winds, yet they are turned with a very small helm. In other words, the direction of our life, either we're going to life or we're going to death, but it's all controlled with the tongue. With the tongue. Not only that, but the destruction. Did you notice what he says in verse number 5? He talks about the fire. A fire can be a great matter. Do you realize how quick fire spreads? Do you realize how one thing spreads and how it destroys? And, and then when it spreads, it sits around. And yes, we may be okay. And it's our four and no more. I applaud you. But that's not God's way. Amen. That's not God's way. It's not that. People say things like that. Well, I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind. Because you're not guarding your tongue. Or it's just who I am. I got the right to feel the way I feel. Husband, wife, mom, dad, Christian, whoever. Yeah, you do have the right to feel the way you want to feel. But you don't have the right to say what you want to say. Not according to the Bible. So the tongue has the ability... Notice what he says in verse number 8. He goes down. He says, but the tongue can no man tame. That means not one of us. You be as good as you want to be. But unless you die to self and you ask God to crucify your flesh, you're never going to be the person. No man, no person could ever tame the tongue. But I tell you who can. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. And friend, it don't take long. You get in a situation, get in a matter. Matter of fact, you be in your house and your marriage and your children or your church. And it's like me. I sit around when I got problems and conflicts and I'm dealing with stuff. I just listen to people talk. And I can tell you real quick who's yielded to the Holy Spirit and who ain't. You said, does that make it right? No. If we all got what was in right, we would all be in hell. There's nothing about this. So we got to understand there's a responsibility. There's a responsibility. You say, Brother Jason, does it matter? Well, I don't have time to be able to go to it. Listen, sometimes we hear things like this. Well, it's hearsay. If y'all have it back there, guys, go to Deuteronomy chapter number 13, verses 12 through 14. How, how many of you ever heard something before and you say it's hearsay? Raise your hand. You ever heard? Oh, it's hearsay. Anybody else ever heard? Well, this is what I heard. That's hearsay. Look up here. Let me give you a biblical response to everything that's hearsay in your life. The Bible says this, If thou shalt hear, say, in one of these cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the certain children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Watch this now. This is how you respond. Then shalt thou inquire. The first thing you do before you get going, and can I just say this respectfully, run in your mouth, is you ask. The second thing the Bible says, notice, he says inquire and make search. Then you seek out truth. There's one side, another side, and then there's the truth. Somebody say amen, friend. Been in this long enough. And then the Bible says, after you ask and after you seek truth, it says, and ask diligently. In other words, if you really need to know, then, then you can search diligently. And behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you. So you find yourself now. What does he say? He says, ask, search. But you don't have to speak it. Do you know what slander is? It's saying something about somebody that's not true. Do you know what biblical also slander is? Saying something about somebody that's true that the Holy Ghost never told you to say. Because when you stand before God and I stand before God, 
He's going to say, were you supposed to say that, Jason? It was true and all, but were you supposed to say it? Because what it does is it brings damage. Christ builds up. The devil builds down. Everybody all right? What are you using, death or life? Death or life. So you see the power of death. How does this happen? Well, I'm going to tell you, you destroy yourself. Don't have time, but in Job chapter number 40, the Bible says in verse number 26, or in verse number 3, that Job came and literally he, he, kept his, he kept his testimony. Matter of fact, he said that he was a man that feareth God and he cheweth evil. And he said, in all this did not God charge God, uh, did not Job charge God foolishly. He kept his mouth closed. Do you know when Job started to struggle? When he began to talk. And the Bible says in chapter 40, you read it. He said, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. And God started speaking to him. You know, what, you know what spiritual people do? They know when to put their hand over their mouth. If you love the Bible, say amen. amen. I'm convicted. Man, I felt like the other day, bro Tia, bro Todd, I felt like I didn't call everybody in the church, but like, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I, I want to know when I speak, that they speak life. We're, we're so adamant to be right about stuff. Listen to me, it's not about being right. It's about them seeing Jesus. It's about learning. It's about going through the process and God molding. And sometimes we're trying to be God and we ruin everything. And sometimes the things that we deal with is not just our problem, but it's a generational problem and it turns into another generation problem and another generation. And there will be generations to come until somebody ever gets back to the place to ever yield to the Holy Spirit. Stay with me. I'll move quickly. Not only do you see the power of of death, but secondly, you see the power of life. You turn back to the scripture, Proverbs chapter number 18, and I want to say this to you, thinking about a woman, the Bible says, talking about a Proverbs woman, a spiritual lady, a virtuous woman, if you want to be a virtuous woman, let me just tell you, the Bible says that a woman speaks kindly with her lips. Amen. A Christian let not corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying grace, it may minister, edifying, it may minister grace unto the hearers. In other words, your words should never be tearing down. It should always be building up, building up, building up, building up. It matters. It matters. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in, in Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 1, that it's a soft word that fixes the matter. Everybody all right? Just because you can put... Just because you can prove somebody wrong and you can put somebody in their place. The Bible don't say that's always the answer. Can I just stop for a second? I'm going to be done in a minute. But I think all of us right now can think. And I mean, you, you may be sitting beside the one. Because I'm going to tell you, there, there ain't a staff member. There ain't a family member. There ain't a church member. That I haven't probably somehow offended, even unintentionally. And I should be able to look at you and say, I'm sorry, because I know I, I'm not a perfect man. Why? Because no man can tame the tongue. So what do you mean by life, Brother Jason? Can we find that in James 3? No, I'm going to give you the best example. And the only example that I know, who is it? It's the Lord Jesus. I don't have time to be able to go through all of it, but the Bible says all throughout the Scripture that literally the Lord Jesus was known without anything that ever happened. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 17, verse number 5, when talking about Jesus, while he yet spake, behold, and then he says at the very end that God spoke out of heaven. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. As he spoke, the words that Jesus spoke was life. Luke chapter number 4, verse number 22, it says, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words. His words are filled with grace that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Every word that came out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus was words of life. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2, verses 21 and 22, it says, it says For even here, hereunto ye are called, because Christ also, also suffered for us, leaving us an example, note that, example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You say, I need, to, I need to know the picture of life, Brother Jason. Can you see Jesus? Can you see Jesus when he hung on the cross of Calvary, when he could have said, it's you that put me here. And he had every right to say that. 
He had every right to look at us and, and those soldiers and say, I'm dying for you. Why could you do this to me? How in the world could you do it? He could have made them feel guilty. But you know what he said? He said these, Father, forgive them. Who's the last person that's hurt us, wronged us publicly or privately? When somebody came to us, instead of us telling somebody what they needed to know, we just said, just forgive them. Pride says, I want them to hurt, and I'll feel better. Do you feel better? Are you any better now that you proved your point? Are you walking on the street of gold, the clouds of glory? No, friend. Words of life came out of Jesus. You say, well, Jason, how do I have those, those words of life? I want to speak like that to my, my husband, my wife, my children, my parents, my, my family, my friend, my co-workers, people that get on your nerves. I understand how. Just like Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane, he got down. And what did he do? He prayed and he said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. How's that sound? I don't want my children to be what I want them to be. I want them to be what you want them to be. I don't want my spouse to be what I think they should be or be like so-and-so. I want them to be what you want them to be. I don't want my church to be what I think it should be. I, I want it to be what you want it to be. Then you'll speak right. Lastly, and I'm done, is someone comes to the piano. And it leads me from that very principle that I just shared with you. Not only is the ability of the tongue the power of death and the power of life, but watch number three, the power of prayer. The greatest thing you can do with your tongue is pray. The greatest thing you can do with your tongue is pray. Let me, let me just park right here for a second. Those same people, husband, wife, enemy, spouse, children, co-workers that get on your nerves listen to me you don't have to look at me but you listen have you prayed for them as much as you've complained about them maybe not audibly but as you've thought about it have you prayed for them are we wishing God would take vengeance What do you mean by prayer, Brother Jason? It's ironic that the very chapter, the very book that talks about the tongue being the book of James, it starts and it finishes with prayer. It speaks about the mouth, but if you notice, if you will, the Bible says in James chapter number 1, verse number 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He said, I don't know what to do, Brother Jason. You better ask it of God. Before you call the preacher, before you call so-and-so to figure out what needs to be done, how to handle the situation. Just because somebody else has a good idea don't mean it's God's way. Ask God what God says you should do about the situation. Amen. Notice, if you will, chapter number 5. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? It availeth much. The greatest thing you can do, and I'm done. The greatest thing you can do with your tongue is not try to give power of death or try to give power of life. The greatest thing you can do is use the power of prayer. And I believe you do the latter part. Watch me now. By prayer, God will intervene. He will turn your heart to where you'll be satisfied of what he does in your family, in your home, in your job, in your church. Somebody say, man, he don't give you the desires of your heart that you want. He gives you the desires of your heart because you love him. Because you love him, you love what he wants. Everybody all right? That's what the Bible says. As they begin to play, read these to you and I'm done. Listen. Psalms 19, 14, listen to this. Just listen to it, please. You can write it down, whatever. Just listen to it. You go back and read it. The psalmist said this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, 
O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, I want everything I do, every intention that I have, every word that I say, I want it to be acceptable in your sight. I read this verse the other day, and I want to share it with you because, like I said, it convicted me and it challenged me. And if you're anything like me, you struggle with stuff. You have to die daily. You, you, you're trying to do your best to live for Jesus, but you just realize I live in the flesh. And friend, you can be saved, but it's saved flesh. Until you get to heaven, you ain't going to have a glorified body. Everybody okay? It's still flesh. Be spiritual flesh, but it's still flesh. Right? Some of y'all say something like this. Well, I wish I could knock their head off in Jesus' name. Nah. Amen. We just had revival right there. Everybody just connected right there. Right? I should listen to this verse. Oh, so convicting. I think this ought to be our prayer. I'm going to start with the men. You women are special. And you balance. But I, I just, I, I challenge the men. Let this be your prayer. Let it be a prayer of your family. For you young adults. Psalms 141.3, listen to this. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. He said, Lord, I can't do it. But if you'll keep the door, God, I'll be able to do it. I think sometimes we do the most when we do the least. We say, God, I can't do it. I'm making a mess of it. Some of our marriages this morning right now have got wounds that they should never have because of the tongue. Some of our kids are carrying anger because of tongue. Some of these kids are dealing with pressures that nobody knows because of the tongue, because of somebody speaking. There's a Christian today that don't feel like they're worthy to be able to serve the Lord anymore and they lost their joy because they don't add up to what everybody thinks they should be because of some other Christian's tongue. I'll be honest with you, I know the Holy Ghost enough in my own life. I don't have to think far back. He can reveal things to me. And I wonder today if you could just say, Lord, and by the way, by the way, look up here. It ain't, it don't go like this. Lord, if I said something. No, you know what you said. Everybody all right? No, it ain't, it ain't if I said. No, you know what you said. I'm sorry. God, I want you to forgive me. I want my family. I want my staff. I want my leadership, whoever it is that's in your life, my children, I want you to forgive me. And God, I want you to guard the door. You stand on your feet, Father. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in, and I pray that today that the Word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today. And maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much. And we are definitely going to be praying for you in this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way. And there's something heavy on your heart. Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much. And may God bless you.